namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya so hari krishna dear devotees uh, thank you for joining us today we wanted to seek the uh, blessings of radha mother radha shyam sundari krishna baram gonitai shila popad and uh, the assembled vaishnavas guru maharaj as well and i wanted to uh, seek uh, their blessings so that we can continue with uh, the 11th canto 10th chapter today quick overview and this is a, um, a nice verse uh, um text number 18 na dehinam sukham kinchit vidyate vidasham api tatha cha dukham mudalam Mrtahankaram param. It's sometimes within the material world, it is observed within the material world that sometimes even an intelligent person is not happy. Similarly, sometimes even a great fool is happy. <laughs> the concept of being becoming happy through expertly performing material activities is simply a useless exhibition of false ego ego egoism. <laughs> Uh, interesting point uh, made in the bhagavatam that uh, intelligent person he should understand that uh, there is no such thing as happiness in this world uh, but uh, and actually he should not strive for happiness so he should never be unhappy but it's also said that a fool sometimes can be happy so <laughs> happiness in distress is just a personal matter um according to one's realization so trying to become happy by performing material activities is not going to happen because in this world um we won't find happiness in temporary um temporary things very interesting the nature of fruitive activity is the name of this chapter in this chapter lord krishna refutes the philosophy of the atheists and describes to Uddhav how the spirit soul bound within the material body can develop pure transcendental knowledge. Okay, so the talks between Uddhav and Krishna continue. He said, Krishna said, taking full shelter in me with mind fixed in bhakti, one should live without personal desire and in varnashram, so he's stressing the varnashram that you should be within the varnas um and the ashram so varnas is the brahman shakti of shudra no choice with that you're born with those qualities um and the ashrams uh brahmachari of grahastha vanapasanyas a purified soul should see that the conditioned soul's endeavors will fail as they have falsely accepted the objects of sense pleasure as truth i.e. permanence that uh, the uh, by enjoying the senses we are uh, going to get uh, is the only truth in the sense that um, this will give us permanent happiness because that's what we're looking for <clears throat> nobody is looking for unhappiness we're all looking for some sort of pleasure some sort of happiness some sort of satisfaction some sort of peace the living entity who is asleep to his spiritual identity is attached to sense objects which are creations of the lord's illusory potency maya and have no permanent existence when one is fully engaged in searching out the ultimate truth one should not accept the scriptural injunctions governing fruitive activities so the scriptures they cater for all types of men especially those who want to fulfill their desires of sense gratification because they're trying to elevate those uh, desires um to a higher level but those who already seek on the path of seeking the absolute truth don't have to consider those Uh, those injunctions as relevant to them taking shelter of a guru uh, observing the scripture injunctions and as far as possible 
injunctions prescribing minor duties such as cleanliness, etc. One should approach a spiritual master who is full of knowledge of him, Krishna, as he is, who is peaceful. So the spiritual master is peaceful and who by spiritual elevation is not different from me. So we have this song, the bhajan that we sing in the morning, Mangalati time, by Vishwana Chakravati Thakavesha, is Saksha Dari Pena Samastha Sastriya. This guru is non-different from me because he's giving the message that, uh, of my message. So the disciple should be free from false prestige, envy, gossip, never considering himself the doer. He should be active, never lazy, <laughs> and should give up all sense of proprietorship, including his wife, children, home, and society. He should be endowed with feelings of loving friendship towards the spiritual master. So Krishna's sort of giving a synopsis of the relationship between the guru and the disciple, ideal relationship. Of course, in this world, this is pretty tough, uh, pretty tough to get the ideal guru and the ideal spiritual, uh, the ideal disciples, very difficult. One should see one's real interest in life, in um, interest in life in all circumstances. So whether it's good or bad, whatever happens, if we have this mood of my Lord knows the best. He knows what's best for me. So, okay, it's not going according to my plan. That means he's got a better plan than I have. <laughs> so in that way, uh, if we have that mood and mentality, even when disappointing uh, things happen, we don't get disappointed. We, we understand there's a higher purpose here. Then we got our self-interest uh, in, in, in line with the Lord. One should see one's self, real self in life in all circumstances and should therefore remain detached from wife, children, home, land, relatives, friends, wealth, and so on. The seer within the body is different from the material body, which is to be illuminated by consciousness, and they possess different characteristics. So we have different characteristics from, this, from the material body. Just as fire may appear differently as dormant, manifest, weak, brilliant, and so on. According to the condition of the fuel, similarly, the spirit soul enters the material body and accepts particular bodily characteristics. So the grass has very little con consciousness, right? Uh, so the spark in the body of, a uh, of, a, of grass is very light, uh, practically dormant. But uh, the spark in the human being is very conscious. Um, so the, the soul has, is extremely alert, or can be extremely alert. So that uh, depends on, on the spirit soul, uh, the consciousness of the soul. The soul is distinct from the gross and subtle material bodies. The spirit soul who has entered into the material body accepts bodily functions according to the reactions of his own past activities. So when something happens to us and somebody is a cause of that, it's important to understand that that somebody who's a cause of it is not the problem. We are the problem. We are the ones who've done the karma and we're getting the reaction. Somebody is an instrument in giving us that reaction, doesn't make them the villain. It's again quite hard to, uh, because we're always looking for somebody to point the finger at, to blame. Um, but if we do that, we'll never have a peaceful life because we're always in our mind agitated because not invariably we will have uh, things going not according to our plan. <clears throat> and somebody will be an instrument in, 
in that uh, process, somebody will be, you know, effectively making us unhappy. But it's not that person's, um, that, that's, that's not that person who's making us unhappy. It's our own karma that's making us unhappy. And if we can understand that, <clears throat> much easier to accept whatever's happening to us. We'll have a much more peaceful life. Therefore, only the bona fide transcendental spiritual master is capable of demonstrating pure knowledge of the self. Atheists, I think that should be atheists uh, who challenge the Lord. My dear Uddhav, there are philosophers who challenge my conclusion. <laughs> they state that the natural position of the soul is to engage in fruitive activities. They accept regulated material work as a purpose of life. Even if you accept such a philosophy, they will, there will still be perpetual birth, death, old age, and disease. Since all living entities must accept a material body subject to the influence of time and suffer the consequent effects of happiness and distress. So even if people have different philosophies, well, there's still this thing called birth, death, old age, disease. You just cannot avoid it, especially birth and death. Old age, maybe nowadays a lot of people don't see it to old age, through to get through to old age, but birth and death always going to be there. And as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, one who dies will be born again. One who is born will die. So this cycle um, continues and thus the consequent effects of happiness and distress are uh, the soul becomes subjected to. When a person is always under the superior control of another, how can he expect any valuable result from his fruitive actions? So in this material world, if we have a boss, you're always going to be uh, under the boss's control. Even if the boss is friendly, still he's superior. Um, this is very much contrasted with the, with the, with the, uh, with the, the spiritual relationship with the Lord. He's very humble. He doesn't necessarily take the superior position. Um, especially when it comes to having a relationship with the Supreme Lord, he will reciprocate according to how uh, we uh, deal with him. So if we want him as our lover or our friend or our son or our parent, he'll reciprocate according to that, according to how sincere, how faithful, how pure we are. So he won't always take the superior position. He doesn't need to, he doesn't have to. His, his nature is humble. He doesn't advertise himself as God when he comes to the spiritual, from the spiritual world. So, so then there, we, come, we come to the worst which we spoke uh, at the beginning. Sometimes even an intelligent person is not happy. Similarly, sometimes even a great fool is happy. <laughs> Even if people know how to achieve happiness and avoid unhappiness, they still do not know the process by which death will not be able to exert its power over them. So no matter how powerful somebody is, it doesn't matter. Time will destroy everything. <laughs> Guaranteed. And as it's said in the Bhagavatam before, this world is just full of names. They'll just be known as a name. That's all it is. Death is not at all pleasing. And since everyone is exactly like a condemned man or woman being led to the place of execution, what possible happiness can people derive from material objects? So Krishna has explained this to the, he's made this world perfectly imperfect. We will never be able to enjoy it as long as we are thinking this is our, our place. This is our eternal place. 
There is no possibility that one who is attached to the fruits of his material work can achieve any substantial goal in life. The pleasures of heaven and other destinations um, which are achieved by sacrificial rites can be experienced as follows. So he gives a little idea of what it's like in heaven. So the heavenly person, person in heaven, travels in a glowing airplane, which is decorated with circles of tinkling bells, which flies wherever he desires. So he's got a lot of power. Being glorified by songs sung by the Gandharvas, dressed in charming clothes, accompanied by heavenly women, relaxed, comfortable, and happy in heavenly pleasure gardens, enjoys life in the heavenly planets. <laughs> Only one problem. When the pious results are exhausted, one's enjoyment is finished due to the factor of time. One must then return to this earth to partake in lamentation and suffering. Prabhuji? Yes. There's no death, there's no old age, death, and diseases in the heaven, is there? Mm. No. no. So you've been. Not, not as such. Mm. Because what happens, I think, is, uh, I think it was described earlier in the Bhagavatam, that um, when the time is up, the garland that the Devata is wearing withers. His body, and his body is not like our body as well, it's, it's more subtle. So the propensity to enjoy is greater. He's not limited by the physical body. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why there's no old age, there's no death, uh, sorry, there's no old age, no disease. Uh, death is in the sense that he will have to leave um, the heavenly place uh, when his good karmas are exhausted. And then he can take, once, uh, once his good karmas are over, he can take into any form, isn't it? Not just a human, but any form. Uh, generally, what would happen, uh, the process is that he would come to this earth in the form of uh, raindrop. So within the raindrop, he would fall into the uh, onto earth and go into a seed, a grain, okay. and then that would be consumed, um, generally become a human being. So he would be implanted into uh, the womb of a uh, a human mother and generally when they come from the heavens they are regarded they still got some tej, you know power so they will be a prince or you know very rich personality or very uh, effulgent charismatic person like that mm -hmm. so when you're going down from heaven you would take birth as a, a human in a very powerful family, perhaps a Brahminical family. And then because of pride, generally you go downwards <laughs> into, into the animal kingdom. And from hell, if somebody is coming from hell, then you go through all the 8 million species of lives until you come to the human platform. So it's the other way around. For coming up from hell, you go through the animal kingdom because you're really degraded at that time. Um, and that's, uh, you know, your consciousness level. Uh, it deserves sort of uh, the bodies of, you know, the, the um, species that don't have too much um, cognizance. Does that make sense, Naima? Yes, yes, probably. Okay. Thank you for asking, that's good. That's good question. Okay, then Krishna explains the destination of a sinful person. If a human being is engaged in sinful, irreligious activities, either because of bad association or because of his failure to control his senses, then such a person will develop a personality full of material desires. He thus becomes miserly towards others, greedy, and always anxious to exploit the bodies of women. When the mind is so polluted, one becomes violent, aggressive, 
and without the authority of Vedic injunctions, slaughters innocent animals for sense gratification. Worshipping ghosts and spirits, the bewildered person falls fully into the grip of an unauthorized, in the grip of unauthorized activities, and thus goes to hell, where he receives a body infected by the darkest modes of nature. In such a degraded uh, body, he unfortunately continues to perform inauspicious activities that greatly increase his future unhappiness. And therefore he accepts, again, a similar material body. What possible happiness can there be for one who engages in activities inevitably terminating in death? So eating, sleeping, mating, defending. If that's all we do in our human life, then we've wasted our life because we are simply behaving just like the animals. They eat, they sleep, they mate, they defend, that's it. If there's no endeavor to find out the purpose of life or the existence of a, find the existence of a superior personality who's created this world, then unfortunately we're stuck in this animalistic mentality and we can't, it's very difficult to even go beyond the animal world kingdom rather than what to speak of coming into the human form and then what to speak of you know, trying to uh, get, become self-realized. <laughs> in all planetary systems from the heavenly to the hellish and for all the great for all of the great dem demigods who live for 1,000 yoga cycles, there is fear of me in the form of time. <laughs> it's not intentional. Right? The Lord isn't wanting to create this fear out of intention. This is just the way this material world works. Time is controlling everything, even Brahma, who possesses the supreme lifespan of 311 trillion 40 billion years. <laughs> He's also afraid of me. <laughs> so, um, the self, Vedic knowledge, the universe, one's own nature, uh, religious ceremonies, and so, oh, sorry, I, that's, that's different context, sorry. The conditioned soul who remains uh, dependent on fruitive activities under the material modes of nature, will continue to fear me. Since I impose the results of one's fruitive activities. So this is the Lord explaining that karma will come. And not, he doesn't do it directly, he does it through his agencies, um, Yamraj, Durga Mata. Those who accept the material concept of life, taking the variegatedness of modes of material nature to be factual, devote themselves to material enjoyment and are therefore always observe, absorbed in lamentation and grief. And we see this, uh, you know, depression, uh, loneliness, you know, it's rampant uh, in this world. Then Uddhav asks further questions. Living entity situated within uh, the material body is surrounded by the modes of nature. And happiness and distress that are born of activities are caused by these modes. How is it possible that he's not bound by material encirclement? And then even this little bit like oh, how you are asking the question, you know, he's made this world in such a way, how do you get out of it? <laughs> You're trapped. So this is the question by... Uh, Uttav, you know, we are surrounded by, you know, um, passion, ignorance, goodness, and everything that was born from that happiness and history. It may also be said that the living entity is ultimately transcendental, has nothing to do with this material world. But then, how is he ever bound by material? How do we get bound in the first place if we we transcendental, nothing to do with this material world? And very interesting questions. The same living entity is sometimes described as eternal, eternally conditioned, and at other times as eternally liberated. I can't understand. This is what Uddhavi is saying. 
therefore the actual situation of the living. Please explain to me the symptoms by which one can tell the difference between a living entity who is eternally liberated, liberated one who is eternally conditioned. So very interesting questions. In what various ways would they remain situated, enjoy life, eat, evacuate, etc.? So uh, he and this chapter ends with these questions, and then Krishna spends quite a long. The next chapter is very is very long and uh, very uh, intense actually. So you take a little bit extra time tomorrow, but very interesting indeed. Any questions? Any comments? Yes, I think interesting because the the questions asked by Uta was what will show further explanation about the mm. living entity and how they are bound and mm. liberated and one who is bound. Yes, it's very very important questions. Extraordinary questions. Yeah. Yeah. Very important questions, and these are the sort of questions that are important to ask. So I'm glad he's asked. <laughs> mm. And we'll see what he says tomorrow. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, Nanuman. Okay, Shimad Bhagavatam Ki Chai.